A lot of things have changed after the pandemic, even in golf. It's become a war of culture in the world, but the sport just won one of its many battles to come. In Australia, the fate of the North Code golf course has finally been decided, so stick around as we give you all the deets on that and more. First up, what exactly has been decided about the golf course? So people who use the course to actually play golf can breathe a sigh of relief because they're still going to have full access to the nine-hole course. This is because Darabin City Council has decided against opening the North Coke golf course to the public after 3 o'clock. The proposal to let golf be played on the property seven days a week was approved by the council with a vote of five in favor and four against. Darabin Mayor Lena Messina even hailed the choice as a major win for the neighborhood in a speech during the meeting. In her eyes, the option's successful because it strikes a balance and benefits everyone. Before the meeting took place, the council's acting manager of recreation and libraries brought out a report that the area should be set aside for golf. This was mostly done by cost-benefit analysis, and the benefits of sharing the course really didn't outweigh the cost that would take. So why was this a bad idea? Now, the analysis suggested that opening the course to the public on Sundays would be better after 3 o'clock. If you've ever been to a public park, you'll understand why this sparked worries about the expense and time involved in cleaning the public's litter. And not to mention, 5.72 hectares of land have already been declared a public space in May. And then there's Mayor Park too, which is pretty close by. So both these spaces were already open to the community. As these decisions always go, some people didn't like this ruling at all. Community to Unlock North Code Golf Course Administrator Ruth Liston criticized the council's choice as evidence that they had utterly failed to consider community input. In her eyes, the failure of this council term would be a lack of vision to find a solution that works for everyone. Up next, why is this a big decision? It's important to remember that when it was off-limits to golfers during COVID-19 lockdowns and when pandemic limitations meant people could only socialize outside, the golf course turned into a popular park for the general public. Locals began to use the green space around the course, especially since there weren't any golf balls flying through the air that could knock you out. All this made it a great place for walks and picnics. So when the golf course reopened, it sparked a turf war. The neighborhood started a campaign to get the council to give the land back to the inhabitants. A petition to keep the area accessible to the public, about 10,000 signatures in 2020, while a campaign to give the site back to golfers received nearly as many. A movement to permanently allow non-golfers access to the property grew, but others who wished to keep the area as a golf course opposed it strongly. But the choice has been made, and according to Darabin Mayor Lena Messina, it was a reasonable compromise. And now we have to realize that Australian golf courses are all in danger. Peter Thompson, the most accomplished male golfer in Australia and a five-time British Open champion, learned the game at the affordable Royal Park Public Course on the lush outskirts of Melbourne. And that's just the start of it. At Waddle Park in Melbourne's east, rubber mats were placed on the tees to prevent damage to the grass from excessive use, and this is where David Graham, the 1981 US Open champion, hit his opening shots. And there are countless more stories like this. We've seen greatness from small beginnings time and time again in this beautiful sport, and it's all thanks to these humble courses. So it's no surprise that this equality and common ground in Australian golf has become a persistent theme, because it's not restricted to country clubs, as it is in some regions of the United States, and because it's not solely determined by demographics, as it still is in Europe. The game has thrived there as a sport. And yes, many would say that there are a lot of expensive private clubs in Australia, where the admission criteria and membership fees reflect the whole privileged white male stereotype. But here's the thing. The appeal of Australian golf has always been the availability of places to hit the ball. Next, some people just don't like the sport. So, from the public courses close to the city to the numerous country clubs that range in caliber from hidden gem to parched sand green monstrosities, the Down Under has it all. Now, times are changing and golf must fight to defend inner-city public courses from greedy developers and progressive local governments that have a bad opinion of the sport. We mean Sydney Lord Mayor Clover Moore has proposed that the 18-hole Moore Park Golf Club, which is located on a prime piece of property close to the SCG, be reduced to nine holes. And get this, he's even spending $50,000 on a plan for public engagement. These people will do anything to get their way. So despite the fact that the golf club's already open to so many people as a public course, Moore will have a little trouble finding locals who agree that the golf course should be donated to the neighborhood. And the reason why is simple. Golf's often seen by many as an elitist sport. This is partly because it failed to broaden its appeal, and now it's gotten the image that it's just a pastime. You can blame this negative representation
representation on the recent nosedive in participation. So there's been a major shift in the image. The numbers don't lie. And Golf Australia states that club membership has decreased from approximately 500,000 in 1998 to 383,794. If that wasn't enough, overall participation in the sport has decreased from 1.029 million in 2016 to 878,000 in 2019. While there might have been a natural decrease from the Greg Norman boom in the 1990s, this is massive. Of course, there was a time when most private clubs had lengthy waiting lists and there was fierce rivalry for tee times at even the most basic public courses. But these numbers reveal a deeper truth too. The sport's fading away and we're fanning the flames. While C.R. Moore could use these statistics to argue that golf courses have become indulgent, that's not really what's been happening. The public golf facilities in inner cities that are being attacked are widely used and stand as endearing symbols of the game's essentially social economic equality. You don't need to be rich to play when you're in one of these courses. So some of these public spaces were used by dog walkers and other people fulfilling their legal obligation to obtain an hour of exercise during Melbourne's COVID-19 lockdown. And now people think they own the place. What was originally a brief loan of the public area has of course turned into entitlement. That's human nature, after all. In Melbourne's inner north, walkers who hacked a hole in the fence to get access to the North Coat Public Golf Course are now asking for permanent land rights. How quickly do the tables turn? Of course, a five iron from a neighborhood hacks club doesn't go well with an unprotected dog walker, which is why the barrier was built in the first place. Well, let's not talk about that. And finally, we have a war on our hands here. So we can see a battle of different cultures here. People from the suburbs feel like golfers are those stereotypical privileged folk, and the game itself is elitist. They see the sport as something to grab land by, land that belongs to the people. But here's what these people don't understand. Those using the local course are actually golf's equivalent of the working class trying to make it big. These golfers can't afford to pay those pricey admission fees, and maybe it's only a hobby. As the game requires acres of green space, a golf course can be seen as being for the exclusive benefit of a few when, in Australia, public courses actually reverse the privilege that lies inside the expensively manicured grounds of private clubs. So now the question becomes, how does the reduction or removal of public golf courses impact the opportunity of players and the potential pool of future stars? Will as many youngsters play their first round of golf on a public course as Thompson, Graham, and so many other aspiring pros did? Will they even play the game anymore? So no matter which side of the debate you're on, you have to admit, closing down or eliminating public golf facilities wouldn't be a good thing. Golf has always been a game for the people, and by removing these spaces, you'd remove the people part completely. That's a wrap for this video. Do you agree with the decision of the council to let Northcote remain a golf course? Let us know in the comments below. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this. See you in the next one. Thanks for watching.